so um, I'm just going to summarise um, what was in the last module before we move on to talking about um, module seven, which is the institutional structure of financial regulation. So we're talking mainly about um, bailouts and bail-ins um, and the advantages of bail-ins over um, bailouts um, and the sorts of ways that banks that are in financial distress are handled. Now we'll move on to Unit 7, which, you know, may seem insignificant at first, which is the um, institutional structure of financial regulation and uh, why regulatory structure is important and the contrasting models of structure between um, the US and the UK. So we'll briefly um, go over that before we go into the final unit. So um, there's two main overriding um, approaches for regulatory structure. There's a single regulator, um, like the Financial Services Bank of England model, or there's a more fragmented um, model, which is a US model, where there are different regulators with responsibility for banking, insurance, security markets, etc. Um, and many factors influence the type of um, industry um, or the type of structure that is most prominent in a particular country. Um, financial crises, uh, crises that have occurred, culture, law, political factors, just so many factors that um, sort of influence how, um, you know, the structure has evolved. Um, and there are three main types. Number one, the common regulator, um, and this is um, a regulator with more than two of the main types of financial activity. The unified regulator, the one that's sitting on the iron throne above all the kingdoms, um, like um, the scene of Game of Thrones, um, where this was the, the, the king uh, sitting on King, king I, I think he was called Ig Igon, who eventually went mad. Um, this is Daenerys' father actually sitting on the iron throne um, as um, ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, uh, so the unified regulator, the iron throne approach, I call it or the multiple agencies model, um, which you see in America, which is fragmented um, with different bodies. Um, and structure is important. Although at first glance, it might seem obscure, effectiveness and structure are related. Um, the multiple agency approach is advantageous in that it supplies, first of all, specialist skills um, and clear responsibilities for each agency. Um, and also the organizations tend to be more nimble and resolve um, issues quicker than a larger bureaucracy. However, they're also, um, according to the evidence and research, more prone to regulatory arbitrage um, because there's so many agencies, so banks can kind of wiggle between the cracks. Um, and there's also overlap of responsibilities. And then there's also neglect of some responsibilities as the lines between um, agencies become blurred. Um, furthermore, um, because of the development of these universal banks, it means banks can play in different sectors and then that ends up with the same organisation being um, monitored and regulated by lots of different agencies, which can lead to um, even more confusion. And I've given the example of GT Bank, a Nigerian bank that has now become GT, GT Holdco in their Holdco structure and they want to go into a whole load of different um, businesses. Um, so, and I pointed out um, on this slide that this point is particularly interesting as an increasing number of Nigerian banks now move into the hold push structure. Um, a final point though about um, a lot of emerging markets is that specialist skills in regulation are actually quite scarce. You know, the amount of experienced um, regulators that we have with the right skills, with the right qualifications um, are very few. So they're often actually not enough pure people um, to be able to spread across different regulatory um, organizations and multiple agencies. So sometimes there's kind of practical reasons um, why that doesn't work in emerging markets. So because of some of the issues around um, multiple, the multiple agency American type approach, are unified regulators the solution? Well, it seems like most of the world at this time is actually moving towards a unified system of regulation. Um, and that's because it can be more cost effective. There's less chance of regulatory arbitrage. Um, they, um, there's less co compliance cost for the banks. Um, it gives a sort of big picture overall view 
a f overall financial stability with, um, without those silos that you get in multi-agency approaches. Um, in terms of the emerging markets I mentioned on the last slide, um, you know, you can do more with fewer skilled personnel because they're all, all in one agency. However, sometimes it can, it's not always true that it reduces arbitrage because of the bureaucracy. Problems with internal communication can still happen. Um, and then also it can conflict with macroeconomic policy if the single authority is actually separate from the Ministry of Health, um, sorry, the Ministry of Finance um, or the Treasury. Um, so, for example, the Ministry of Finance um, might be trying to push the banks in a certain direction. Um, and then because the regulatory authority is more concerned with preventing a banking crisis um, as opposed to stimulating the overall economy, um, then they might have different objectives. Overall trends in banking um, supervision. So some of the things that we're, we're seeing um, regulatory authorities moving towards um, the FSI did a survey um, in 2006, and these are some of the trends. Um, but just I wanted to point out another trend. Um, again, the Met Gala um, 2021, Lewis Hamilton bought a table and um, he invited upcoming black designers um, to sit on his table. And you can see there, they're, they're also um, very, very trendy people. And I felt like this was such a really impactful and innovative way for him to open doors. Um, for black creatives that perhaps uh, don't have those networks um, that you would typically find at the Met Gal uh, Gala. So I was really proud of him for that and um, sort of a very trendy appearance there. But we're talking about a different type of trend and we're talking about trends in um, banking supervision. So what we're seeing in banking supervision is actually a movement to a more unified approach, to a more UK-based approach. Um, independence um, of central banks has been a long-standing thing. So um, moving central banks and, and the responsibility of central banking away from the Ministry of Finance. Um, and banking regulation itself seems to be separating from um, central banking due to potential conflicts, um, e.g. this tension of, um, you know, saving banks might require more liquidity, whereas the overall economy might need a more restrictive monetary policy. Um, so um, there may be conflicts between um, a regulator um, bank regulation and central banking for the economy. So some um, some countries have separated them. Um, and then new departments um, within central banks. Um, we're seeing a lot of new departments focused on these macro prudential um, policy tasks that I spoke about um, a few units ago. Um, so these are some of the trends that we're seeing according to the FSI survey 2006. So um, we're going to finish with um, a brief look at the UK's sort of iron throne approach um, versus the US's more fragmented um, approach. The UK is highly integrated, the US is highly fragmented, uh, but both approaches kind of failed uh, during the 2008 crisis, indicating that there really isn't a single answer. The US has a hundred, over 100 agencies for financial regulation and has been criticized for lack of updated technology and market expertise, hasn't adapted to the evolution of more universal banks. And there's a lot of duplication um, in, in the work that all of these different agencies do. But despite the duplication, no one agency is taking leadership during the crisis. And um, proposals actually have been made to try and um, find an overall coordinating um, body um, to coordinate these activities. However, the UK had a single agency, the FSA, um, responsible um, for, as well, in addition to the uh, central bank as a lender of the last resort. Unfortunately, like during the crisis, the FSA was super focused on restoring interbank lending and putting liquidity back into the system and asked the Bank of England to extend credit to the banks and restore liquidity. However, the Bank of England was concerned about moral hazard. They don't have the Bank of England's mandate is not to or was not to at that time restore liquidity to the banks. It was worried about moral hazard and it was worried about monetary policy, i.e. the kind of inflation that perhaps this uh, liquidity would cause. So like one day it said no, it wasn't going to provide the liquidity. The next day it came up and said yes, it reversed its decision. And it was just seen as undecisive and a, and a really sort of poorly managed situation. Um, 
so following that um, and then the sort of nationalization of Northern Rock, which was um, a large uh, British bank, um, the FSA actually ceased to exist um, and the Prudential Regulation Authority and the Financial Conduct Authority um, then started operations in its place. So the PRA, the Prudential Regulation Authority, is actually a subsidiary of the Bank of England and is responsible for prudential res uh, regulation of deposit taking institutions, um, in as well as building societies and credit unions, as well as insurers and investment firms. Um, which might originate or propagate systemic risk, while the Financial Conduct Authority is responsible for market functioning um, and for the conduct of regulation for all financial services firms and the prudential regulations of the firms that are not supervised by the PRA, e.g. like um, asset managers. So that's how they've sort of um, reformed their system. Um, but basically, um, what I've tried to teach in this slide is that there's no right answer to this. Um, the UK approach um, and the US approach both did not work um, when it came to the uh, financial crisis. And I think sort of the, my, over, my overall learning um, from this is that there's no fixed way of doing financial regulation. Um, and I think that sometimes the financial industry and the innovations, and now you're seeing a lot of fintech and a cryptocurrency, like the, the central banks just don't keep up um, with the speed of innovation. Um, and, and I think that that has been sort of the problem. Innovation moves faster than policy. Um, and you can see there this picture saying, not my job, but that was the problem in the, in the US. There were so many agencies um, and they weren't sure what they were supposed to do. And some people were saying, oh, that's not my job. That's a, that goes to another agency. And nobody could quite figure out. There was so much blurring of the lines. So I thought that, that was that was an interesting picture to demonstrate that. Oh, wow. It's been not even two hours and I'm already on the last unit. Um, well, the last unit is a very beautiful one because I'm talking about offshore um, financial centres and issues in international regulation and supervision. It's a beautiful beach and this is how I imagine um, offshore um, financial centres look. So for our final unit, there are two things involved. The emergence, benefits and challenges of offshore financial centres. Um, that represent a unique form of regulatory arrangements focused on attracting international capital and um, capital market activity. And then the contribution to strengthened regulation and supervision made by selected international institutions, um, such as the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the Financial Stability Forum, um, and the role of the IMF and the World Bank. So what is an offshore financial center? I think there's the main ways um, to spot what an offshore financial centre is, um, is to look at a country living beyond its means. And I can remember um, in Nigeria, um, somebody on social media was saying that, you know, the reason why we have um, currency problems is because Nigerians like to eat seedless grapes. So I just put um, a, a picture of the seedless grapes here. And perhaps if Nigerians weren't eating seedless grapes, and living beyond their means, then you know we wouldn't have so much of a currency fluctuation. Um, and I think you know if you're looking for a, to define or look at features um, of an offshore um, financial centre, just look for countries that seem to be living um, above beyond their means. So countries that have a disproportionately num uh, disproportion disproportionately large number of financial institutions. So look at a place like Jersey that has a population of under 10 million, that's 500 international institutions, right? And then um, a high level of external assets and liabilities in the financial system far be beyond the level necessary to service the financial requirements of the domestic economy. Um, a high concentration of financial activity with non-residents, so people that don't live there um, are banking there. And then, of course, low regulation or low to no taxes and secrecy laws. So why are they important for regulators? Um, because of the interconnectedness. So these financial centres um, are very connected to financial centres like London, New York and Tokyo, 
which means that they influence the global financial system and that means that they produce systemic risk and influence global financial stability. Upsides and downsides of offshore financial centers. I think that you know banks and offshore financial centers have a somewhat symbiotic relationship like the bee and the flower. So the bee sucks the nectar out of the flower and uses it um, to make food. And the bee, while sucking the nectar out, actually gets some of the, po uh, some of the flower's pollen um, on, on, on its body. So when it goes to the next flower, it actually uh, cross-pollinates and, and that's how they're able to propagate. Um, so the bees and flowers have um, a symbiotic relationship, they help each other. Um, and in the same way, um, there are advantages for both the host country and the bank, um, because offshore um, financial centres um, have extra skilled jobs. Um, they boost the economy through tax income if they uh, pay tax. The banks pay tax, they pay a little bit of tax, but obviously it's a lot for a small country. Um, they reduce the overall transaction costs um, for people, for customers, um, because usually going to an offshore financial centre is a form of regulatory, um, regulatory arbitrage. Um, so because the cost of operation of the bank is low, transaction costs are lower as well. Um, and it's an opportunity for small island countries that, that may not have any alternative sources of income. The disadvantages, of course, is that they are used for regulatory arbitrage. Um, so the um, home countries um, lose out, um, lose out on tax income. They usually have high risk um, assets, undermining the financial sector stability as a whole. Um, they might sell on some of these sophisticated products that nobody understands to so the domestic uh, residents in the um, offshore financial centers who may not understand them. Um, they might actually even be financing terrorism due to the secrecy laws, I mean, um, that are enacted, and that's that's a massive problem. And then also um, the tax evasion, which can produce a fiscal risk to the, the home countries. So um, who are the people solving this problem? Who are the people trying to put together international standards um, for um, the banking, international banking industry or the global banking industry? So all banks can be aligned in terms of what to what to do and how to regulate and to reduce the risk of um, or the occurrences of regulatory um, arbitrage. Um, I think that the, 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 there's a group of institutions that I like to call the Avengers, the Avengers of the international global financial regulatory system. Um, and the four that I'll be talking about on this slide are the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Um, that provide guidance on banking supervision internationally, the Committee on Global Financial Stability, um, that have a mandate actually beyond banks and concentrate on guidelines and um, sort of recommendations for the whole um, of the financial sector, the Financial Stability Forum, which was established after the East Asia crisis and focused initially um, on issues related directly to the crisis, but now works on um, guidelines or guidance for the management of highly leveraged institutions and um, also on deposit insurance. And then the Financial Sector Assessment Programme, um, which is a joint initiative of the World Bank and the IMF and um, an associated uh, assessment of the financial se sector stability known as the Financial Sector Stability Assessment, which you might have seen. Um, it's published on the IMF website and is conducted by the F um, IMF. The FSAP report reports on the country's compliance with a wide range of voluntary international standards and codes um, representing best practice in banking and the financial um, sector regulation and supervision. Ethics. So this is the last slide and um, I think underlying all these discussions is a relationship between politicians and the banking system, which is centered around the role of safety nets, number one, um, and also political pressure on banks to extend credit to sectors that attract voters, like housing, right? 
So there's always pressure on the banking system to do certain things, and that pressure is political. Um, and this political cover given to regulators kind of exemplifies the ethical issues around credit going to politically favorable blocks of people, individuals, and institutions. Um, and then there are also additional ethical issues um, around offshore financial centers and their secrecy laws, for instance. Um, so, you know, just finishing on the point that, you know, we've said all this technical information and we've, we've, we've spoken extensively around different topics um, around regulation and banking crisis, um, but we haven't spoken much about the political forces at play. Um, and I think it's important to remember that banks um, are not just economic entities. Um, no business is a solely economic entity. Um, they're also also political and uh, legal agents as well. Um, and political as economic factors act on these corporates, but political forces also act on these corporates. Um, and really that kind of brings us to the end of this um, module on bank regulation and banking crises. Are you not entertained? <laughs> um, I hope it's it's been an interesting journey. I, I hope you've learned what I kind of set out to um, explain, um, the elements and objectives of bank regulations and, and, and why we regulate banks in the first place and why we don't we don't regulate tomato sellers and we, we don't necessarily regulate people that sell clothes or shoes. Um, the, the international rules um, for prudential regulation, so Basel 1, 2 and 3 and how they came about. Shadow banking sector and the effects that the shadow banking sector has on overall um, financial stability. Macro pru, um, so in addition to the um, micro prudential approach. Um, to regulation, also the increasing role of macro pro and um, how it works and what it aims to do and the instruments it uses um, to achieve its aims. Um, then deposit insurance and the lender of the last resort and how the effect that um, deposit insurance and the central bank as a lender of the last resort have on um, financial system stability um, by providing explicit and implicit guarantees um, which produce moral hazard. Um, dealing with bank failure, so how we deal with bank failure um, and the advantages and disadvantages of bail-ins versus bailouts. Um, the institutional structure of bank regulation um, and the iron throne type regulation as opposed to um, with one um, sort of overall umbrella body compared to the sort of multi-agency fragmented um, structure that you see in America. Um, and then ethical issues um, around offshore financial centers and um, what the uh, avengers of global finance are doing to um, find solutions. I hope um, that you've learned something. I hope that you've been entertained. Um, I hope that you've been educated and I hope that um, you've had as much fun in the past two hours as I have. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. If you have any feedback, um, please comment. Um, I've really enjoyed doing this and I hope you've enjoyed listening.